Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, we dig into the Senate Republican tax relief bill, hearing from the committee chair and the ranking minority member. We'll also learn about a measure to require hands-free technology for Minnesota drivers. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. According to Minnesota's Office of Traffic Safety, distracted or inattentive driving is a factor in one in four crashes in this state. 14 states and the District of Columbia have laws requiring hands-free technology for drivers. A bill sponsored by Senator Jim Carlson could make Minnesota the 15th state, and he now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. I have a confession. I do sometimes use my cell phone when driving. After listening to the testimony at the committee, after doing research on this topic, I think I'm gonna stop. Why isn't this already a law? Primarily, it has been, there's been some resistance and one of the studies that you, or one of the thoughts that you uh, may think about is that there's that thought that a hand held and a hands free are not different in how distracted they, uh, they lead drivers to be. Uh, and that's been a little bit of the hang up. Uh, I've sponsored this bill or co-sponsored it since uh, 2008 and I think that uh, we're finally getting there now where people are realizing that the hand held phone up to your ear is something that is really distracting for people uh, and I think that there I think there is somewhat of a difference especially when you're dedicating a hand to that you know that device it's different than uh, speaking to your your uh, dashboard or speaking to in your your ear uh, and I think that there is some difference now the studies don't confirm that or let's say they're not clear on that but what we do know is that the crashes that we're finding do have some telephone component to the, to them and usually it's the hands-free that's the one that stands out it stands out as being more safe or safer? The, the hands-free stands out as being more safe. Okay, correct. then, yes. then mm -hmm. holding it in your hand right. and scrolling and... And of course, you know, the, the thing, you know, that adds to that is that, you know, let's say you're a smoker, you know, you keep one knee firmly on the wheel, is that how you drive? And uh, <laughs> So it's, uh, you know, there are other things that enter in here where the other hand has to be free to be able to turn on the turn signal, to put on the wipers, to do other things like that, and to hold the steering wheel. There were no testifiers against this bill. So what is, is there opposition? I have not had anyone come to me with opposition. I do know that there may be one or two legislators that are in the, uh, let's say, greater Minnesota areas. For instance, one of the things that has been a, uh, a detail in the anti-texting laws has been that you can't text at all, even when you're stopped in traffic. Uh, and generally you're stopped in traffic for a stoplight, a semaphore. Mm -hmm. And uh, Senator Tory Westrom said, in my district, we don't have any stoplights. So there's, you know, there, there might be some resistance in, say, the greater Minnesota areas where, you know, they just don't have that kind of traffic level. But as I answered him in committee, that I think you need to develop the good habits so that that time when you're at a stoplight that you don't, um, you know, you're not susceptible to that, uh, that tendency to pick up your phone. If I understand the bill correctly, there would be no cell phone use at all by the driver except for one touch technology. So you'd have to be able to talk to your car or have the earpiece in in terms of, of interacting with your phone. And if you had to touch your phone, it would just be to swipe. Is that correct? That's, that's generally correct, yes. Uh, you know, we have Bluetooth devices that are in the ear that have a, a button on them that you push to, uh, to initiate the dial tone. Uh, some of uh, the more sophisticated phones, you just speak to them. You speak to Siri and you say, call Mike. Mm -hmm. And it will ask you who Mike is, and then you, you, know, you give the last name or the detail, and they will the cell phone will find the number. And with many of the, uh, the automobiles today have the Bluetooth technology built in. So when your phone enters the car, the car, uh, the dash, the radio, automatically pairs with your phone. So now you can talk directly to the radio and it will talk through your phone. Well, so Apple 
CarPlay and Android Auto are already incorporating software into new vehicles, um, systems on dashboards. And Gartner, a leading IT research advisory company, predicts that this technology will be in 77 million cars by 2020. Uh, there's also the issue of a technology hangover that, that you know, using these devices isn't, one, isn't completely safe. There's still risk, and they talk about a technology hangover, that there's delay in, in people's reaction time still. So in terms of the safest driving possible, is this, a, is this going in the right direction? Uh, no, I don't think it's the safest driving possible, but I, I don't think that even having your radio on is the safest, safest driving possible because you know, even I will listen to the radio and I like to go between stations and I'll punch a station and I'll you know, be hitting those buttons. And you know, until we have all of that voice controlled, we're not going to get safer. And until we have it perhaps even thought controlled, it might not be the safest we can go. But at least this way, we're getting it out of the person's hand. And that, you know, keeping it from occupying a hand while they're driving, uh, and that gets uh, your attention more directly on the road. There are so many distractions in an automobile that I don't know that you could ever eliminate all of them. And of course, we're going to self-driving cars eventually in some cases. And, well, then you uh, can do whatever you want. <laughs> hopefully, yes, yes. You know, one of the things that uh, we always talk about with self-driving cars is they obey the law, so they don't speed. Yes, they don't cut the corners. They element. stop at uh, right turns. All of those kinds of things. So, and those make it uh, much safer. Senator Carlson, I want to thank you for your time today, and and I look forward to seeing if this bill goes anywhere. Well, me too. I'm hoping that it does. I'd like to see it be passed on its merits, and that's something that. Uh, you know, we, uh, we and uh, meaning the, uh, the supporters of it who have lost loved ones are really pushing to get this passed, you know, and in the memory of a lot of those people who have uh, passed away because of inattentive driving. Senator Carlson, thank you. Thank you. The philosophical divide over transportation funding emerged in the Senate Transportation Committee this week as committee members wrestled with the transportation omnibus bill. The bill proposes a major boost in spending for road and bridge infrastructure. Do you, do you think it's fine to just, just uh, address the needs of folks who have the ability to own and drive a car and just leave everyone else who has mobility needs on the basis of age or um, disability or income to the side just to be forgotten about? I mean, do you, do you fundamentally believe that transit is just an extra add-on that can be addressed at a future point in time and it's okay to, to pass a roads-only bill? It's, it's like transportation, however, it's very expensive, and I, and I do wish to address it. But how do we address uh, transit at this stage of the game, knowing that there are a number of members, for instance, at, at, in this committee, that genuinely and deeply support light rail? And there are members that genuinely and deeply oppose it. We do not have a consensus on light rail. And I think that's one of the linchpins to the issue re re revolving around transit. Transit gets treated as outside of transportation. And I think it is fundamentally important that we remember that transportation is not separate from transit and transit is not separate from transportation. It is just like our ports, just like our rails, just like our roads and bridges, just like bike and pedestrian. Those are ways that people get around in our communities and we need to remember that. And those, that language is important. People need to remember that transit is part of Minnesota's transportation system. We need to make sure that when we are dealing with the concept of transportation and transit in that area like that, that we have a comprehensive look and make sure that we don't go spending dollars now that in the future we will regret because we didn't think of <coughs> some of the things that are yet on the horizon. There is no new revenue in this bill. There's shifts, and with all due respect, there's gimmicks of illusions that we are increasing funding for transportation when we are indeed moving money from different sources that are already coming in, putting them in to this, the transportation bill that you presented to us, and we're expected to really fill in the gap that we know exists in funding. I I've supported tax revenue, new tax revenue, different, uh, different controversial ways of being creative to fund that gap, 
but keeping the status quo is, is really neglectful. Uh, in, in terms of uh, your statement that there's no new money in the tra this transportation bill, that isn't true. There's over a billion dollars of new money in transportation in this bill. There isn't any new money in terms of uh, new taxes that we have extracted out of our citizens on top of and above what we already tax them on. But there is no, there is new money in this bill. Senate Republicans began the process of rolling out their advancing Minnesota agenda with the announcement of a $900 million tax relief plan to promote economic growth. Joining me in the studio is the chair of the tax committee, Senator Roger Chamberlain. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. The most expensive part of the plan calls for a permanent tax cut to the lowest tax bracket. You say this will benefit 81% of taxpayers. What is the percentage of the tax cut and is it a permanent across the board tax cut? It's a permanent tax cut. It'll be for the lower lowest bracket. We're, st we're working out the details on the best way to approach it. So we have a very good idea where that number is going to be and we're pretty set with it. But it's still a work in progress. As far as uh, who gets, uh, who's impacted the most? Low and middle income taxpayers will be impacted the most. The great thing about numbers and taxes is that they can be worked and manipulated in a lot of different ways to get the results you want. And that's what we're doing. So it'll be mostly low and, in low and middle income taxpayers. And uh, the numbers we used, um, so the percentage will be greater on the lower middle income side. And it will be on the upper side. So it will be f uh, phased, set differently according to different tiers of income? Uh, we'll have, well, pretty much, right. It gets pretty difficult to explain, but uh, the way the numbers work, we can adjust it so that uh, the low and middle income get the bulk of the, uh, get the, bulk of the uh, uh, relief. Will there still be some tax cuts, though, for upper income Minnesotans? There will be tax relief for every Minnesotan in various ways, whether it's uh, through business or through uh, fixing Social Security or a variety of other things as well. And we got a long way to go too before we get done with this whole process. Okay. Um, well, and you mentioned Social Security. The idea of phasing out taxes on Social Security has been floating around for some time. Mm -hmm. Minnesota remains one of 13 states that continues to tax Social Security. Mm -hmm. Democrats say the state can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Why is this the year to do it? Well, our goal again I, I, our goal has always been to give relief and reform, give relief to Minnesotans and bring reform to the tax system. We really, really do need it. 17 years without uh, any real reductions or relief to Minnesotans. The rates have been going up on everything. And uh, the word I used yesterday was gobs of money. We are, we are shaking Minnesotans down. We've been doing it for decades. And it's been for 17 years. So if we can give tax relief to billionaires to build stadiums and I like the stadiums I love the stadiums I love the sports but fair is fair they've been handing out money to special interest and a lot of money to to build a lot of stadiums in the last 10 years it's time to give relief to Minnesotans so our package we'll give it to everybody now back to Social Security uh, this year again uh, the premise for all this is we need relief Social Security is uh, again it can be sliced and diced a lot of different ways and we're gonna have to look at how that fits into our final package. We only have $900 million. That seems like a lot of money, but when you start um, putting these numbers in there, it goes away pretty quick. So we have priorities, and we're going to work with the Social Security side to uh, start reforming that and reducing it. So now is the year because we need to take baby steps to start reforming this whole process and uh, you know, giving Minnesotans relief and giving our economy a shot in the arm. Uh, for the Social Security mm -hmm. relief, will it phase out above a certain income? Um, we are looking at a variety of ways of doing it, and um, it is expensive to do. So it depends on how that fits in the priorities. Uh, we can raise the caps where they start paying. Uh, we can uh, do a lot of different things there as well. So, or we can start phasing in later. But, but um, we have we're still working on that as well. And when do you expect out, to so. have some of these answers? We are putting the bill together. We uh, have been started to started putting the pieces into the bill uh, based on our priorities, our caucus priorities, uh, good policy. So we'll have something probably next week because uh, our members, our, our staff has to start putting the bill together and they're starting that now. 
but I'd, I want to consult and speak with our tax committee uh, members before we release the final pieces of that bill. Well, let's talk about one more aspect that, that will benefit, mm -hmm. you know, not businesses, but more individual. Minnesotans, uh, student loan debt is a significant challenge mm -hmm. for, for many people. Mm -hmm. And bills to help students with their loan, right. it, it has bipartisan support. Yep. Would your proposal focus on college graduates or all students with debt? I think it has to, my thought, again, you can structure this in a number of ways, mm -hmm. but I believe we have to look at people who have actually graduated and have a degree. I think that would be a good place to start. Overall, it's, I'm going to be honest, it's not good policy to do this because we're subsidizing that sort of stuff. But uh, if we can give some relief, uh, I think we should, but we should be careful about how we do it. We have limited funds and we want to make sure we have good policy that helps people out and doesn't get, uh, once you put something in law here and you start giving away money, it's really hard to take it back. That's it true. It really is. The uh, property tax proposal for farmers who get stuck paying the bulk of, yep. of student uh, district levies mm -hmm. is also part of the governor's plan. It yep. was in last year's failed tax bill. Mm -hmm. uh, last year's number was 40%. The governor's current bill is 40%. Is that where you think yes. you'll fall in also? Same, same. I can give you details on that. It's the okay. same as last okay. year. It's important relief. We uh, When we started, I. I uh, had some people take a different look at this to see how we could do it, if it could be done differently and in a better fashion. It's not the best way to do these things again, but uh, the ag land is an interesting, unique piece, and it gets stuck. So we can give some relief to the farmers. So the number is the same as last year, language is the same as last year. So yes, I can answer definitively on that one. That one's there. Uh, one last question. Another part would exempt the first $100,000 of business property tax and end automatic inflation that was put in place in 2001. Right. Why is this necessary? We need, part, again, there's two parts of the, to the plan. One is uh, uh, giving uh, relief to Minnesotans, putting more money in their pockets, giving us more control, baby steps to reform what we're doing and to charge up the economy. We can't just rip the Band-Aid off, so we're going slowly with this uh, with this. Uh, triage, I guess you say, patching the holes and stopping the bleeding. And the second part is uh, business property, business relief. Uh, we uh, have some, this often supply side and demand side. So we're offering the demand side, which is the individual uh, taxpayer side, and then the supply side, business side. Spending money, investing money. So uh, across the state, when they initially put the uh, uh, business property tax in the statewide general levy, they had different ideas and different purposes. It has not solved the problem and it is crushing businesses across the state. It is crushing them. It is sometimes uh, equal to or more than half of what, um, at least half or equal to the local property tax burdens that these uh, businesses are paying. So again, supply side, business investment, sm small businesses, Main Street, Minnesota, that's what we're targeting with the, all businesses with the freeze and the $100,000 piece tends to help out the smaller businesses a little bit more. It means more to them. So again, we need businesses to invest and buy and purchase, hire employees and uh, help drive the economy. And that's the only way we're going to get out of the demographic problem we're going to face in a few years. Senator Chamberlain, I look forward mm -hmm. to seeing what, what the tax proposal mm -hmm. ends up being and I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Tax is exciting stuff. Thank you. <laughs>
and then we spent it um, on the um, insurance bill, I think we should put that back to start with to keep us um, in, uh, in good stead with the bond houses and our AAA rating. I certainly think that uh, since we haven't had a tax bill in, um, I think, since 2013, that we should work really hard to have a bipartisan agreement on um, a tax bill this year and to provide um, some tax relief. Is 900 million um, the right number? I think that that certainly is uh, certainly less than what the House is proposing, but it's it's a whole lot more than what the governor is proposing. And I think that the we need to. Um, be uh, responsive to things like investments in in education and I think some of the people that otherwise might be getting some sort of tax break from the Republican plan if you ask them do you want a hundred dollars more or do or would you like to see the money invested in education in in uh, uh, keeping the elderly in their homes or good care in nursing homes or um, or in uh, transportation and transit, I think you'd probably get a wide variety of responses to that, uh, to that question as to where people's priorities are. The Republicans argue that the state must cut taxes on Social Security to keep those older Minnesotans in the state. What is your perspective on this issue? Well, first of all, um, I think we probably will be doing something in uh, Social Security taxation relief. We are one of uh, just a handful of states that taxes to some extent, and we, we are a conforming state, so we follow the federal guidelines. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, many recipients of Social Security don't pay any taxes on their Social Security income at all. I don't know what the figure is, but I think it's something like 20 percent. If Social Security is what you live on, um, it's very unlikely that you would have an income from other sources that would be so high that your Social Security income would be uh, taxed. So the, um, the challenge is if we're trying to give tax relief to Social Security uh, recipients that are in the kind of the middle range, I think that that's something that we're going to see some bipartisan support on. But um, the DFL is not interested in giving um, a Social Security tax break to people whose uh, uh, tax returns show that they have a half million dollars in income. And right now, the proposal that we have seen from them has just been, let's get rid of all the taxing uh, of Social Security income. And I don't think that's very you'd like efficient. There, you'd like there to be a and cutoff. And we have, uh, we have a, um, the DFL has a proposal that I've authored that would, would uh, uh, simply give a subtraction from Minnesota uh, taxable income uh, for a, uh, 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 a stated amount um, of any taxable income that comes from, uh, uh, from Social Security, and we would index that for in inflation over the years. But rather than um, giving a tax break to people that uh, otherwise have uh, incomes of a half million dollars. I don't, I don't think that kind of tax break is what keeps those folks in Minnesota or causes them to leave. In your response to the Republican budget plan, or tax plan, you were critical that their plan doesn't mention local government aid. Why do you think local government aid is important? Well, first of all, on a more general level, I think their plan was uh, uh, severely lacking in specifics. <laughs> And it may well be that when we actually see their bill that we're going to see uh, some accommodation and increase in, uh, in local government aid, at least at the level that the governor has proposed, which is $20 million, and which is the similar amount that was in um, the veto tax bill of, of last year. That had bipartisan support. Yeah, that had a strong bipartisan support. So I would... I would be actually surprised when we start getting uh, details that there wasn't some increase in in, um, uh, in local government aids. There's none in the House tax bill, but I I, I think uh, we're going to see. Uh, um, I hope we're going to see a um, a better attitude from the Republicans toward local government aid. And why is it important? Well, first of all, we've been cutting when we had. Uh, 
the recession. We uh, and 15 starting 15 years ago or so, we started cutting local government aid, and we have not yet gotten back to the level that we were uh, before the recession in the mid in the mid uh, 2000s. And um, uh, local governments, particularly those in um, in Greater Minnesota. Um, they really depend upon it be because of their tax base to provide uh, adequate infrastructure. And I think it is, um, uh, it is a wise investment on the part of the legislature to uh, make sure that um, we don't have local governments across the state that, uh, that have struggling tax bases to, um, to present such a challenge to them in their budgets that um, they have to ask their, their constituents uh, to go without really, really needed improvements and, um, uh, and programs for their, uh, for, their, uh, for their citizens. One last question. Uh, the Republican plan is, is promoting economic growth, as they say, and the proposals would exempt the first $100,000 of business tax and the automatic inflator provide tax incentives for new business uh, new businesses to purchase equipment. They say these are reforms that small businesses are asking for. Do you support these kinds of reforms? Well, I, I do think we need to revisit the statewide business property tax. That went into effect in the Ventura reforms in 2001. And I don't think, I think it's a failed program now in terms of how it was originally supposed to be a substitute for, for asking businesses and, and uh, cabin owners to participate uh, in the, um, uh, the uh, school district's referenda. And <clears throat> that was going to be the substitute. But, um, and the dollars were originally supposed to go to the schools. And then within the first year, um, uh, uh, Governor Pawlenty ordered that repealed, and so it's just gone into the general fund. Mm -hmm. And I think that the um, the feature of it that I believe would make the most difference is getting rid of the inflator, and I have supported that in the past. When we um, exempt the uh, first 100,000 or 200,000 of market value from the statewide business property tax. It certainly um, is a gesture to um, uh, the uh, greater Minnesota uh, Main Street businesses, but um, it's not going to have to all that much right. of an effect on on um, uh, on businesses yeah. in the metropolitan area that have. Um, that have uh, many millions of dollars of, uh, of uh, value that that one hundred thousand dollars is is um, is hardly a hiccup. Senator Russ, I'm sorry, we have to you stop. You have to go. We have to I stop. I can talk about tax policy know, you forever. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. Of course, it's my pleasure. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.